Welcome to all of you sitting here and any others who are sitting across the country on Zoom as uh, Mike and I were with you right the way through 2020 and 21, etc. It is always such a delight to be back with you. We both feel so held in your love and it remains with us when we sometimes go through, as you do when you're getting a little older, when we go through the times in life that are troublesome and in a world at the moment that seems to be somewhat upside down. This service is very much about peace and you each have um, a white peace dove Later on in the service, you will see uh, some photographs that were taken in Chichester Cathedral, which is our nearest city, where they had the most beautiful display of these peace doves. I'm not going to say any more about them because you need to see the images to actually appreciate how stunning and incredible they were. I'm just going to move my step. It's rocking it's rocking like a rocking chair, which you don't really want. And so Carol is going to come and light our chalice flame this morning. <clears throat> You've got a choice. You can have Unitarian matches, or you can have... Try a newfangled... Well, yeah, Unitarian matches, I feel just often so... Oh, that one does. Always oh, gone out again. You might have to use the matches. I think I'll use the old fashioned. Yes, yeah, try those. Oh, well done. These are not Unitarian matches. <laughs> Unitarian matches, you have to light at least six before you get one that lights. Thank you. May doves of peace surround us as we light our chalice flame when globally it seems peace and reconciliation are on the brink. Indeed, it sometimes seems that all we've ever been, all we've ever stood for, is standing on the brink. And all that humanity continues to hope for and struggles to create needs restoration. To restore a deeper peace, a larger love, a more embracing hope and a deeper joy in this life that we share. May doves of peace surround us as we and others around our globe light ours and their chalice flames, knowing that it always burns within our hearts. That was adapted from uh, some lovely words by Leslie Takashi, a multicultural anti-racist and universalist minister. She's also inspired my opening prayer. <clears throat> I'm going to be asking you to, if you are able to, wish to, to join hands in a moment with anybody that you're near. So we bring our thoughts, our intentions, our prayers to each other, to the source of all being, the God of our understanding, the source of peace and love. Whenever we shake hands, clasp hands in greeting, link arms in affection, hold another in a loving or comforting embrace, when two people unite, between them they formed a bridge over which love can pass, both in the peaceful and the tumult of life. And so, in our chairs here, in our rows, alongside each other, with anyone who is beside you, anyone you can reach behind you or in front of you, just for a moment or two, link hands. May we always be ready to build bridges, and when we do, may doves of peace hover above us, and we release the symbolism of our joined hands, but we express our commitment to remaining connected. 
with those across our world who are oppressed or in danger from the injustice of discrimination because of gender, sexuality, disability, faith, or simply difference. Remembering that a bridge may be an escape route above or a refuge beneath. We bring our focus of peace to the many countries around our world. Where there is terrorist or civil conflict, where there are drugs, drug wars, and we direct our peace prayers to Gaza and Israel, Russia and Ukraine, and any other places that are special to you in your heart and beliefs. When peace seems to be at its most elusive, if we find peace within by deeply, extravagantly loving and accepting ourselves, it is then that excess of love abounds for others in which peace lies. And so we build between ourselves and through our prayers stronger bridges that beneath their arches there will be shelter for those for whom secret protection is the only choice, that there may be paths for those who can emerge and be led to safety, that there may be ways and means for love and peace to flow freely from minds, from hearts, from places and people ruled by destructive conditioning and hatred. May it flow to minds and hearts and places and people for whom love and peace has been globally transforming. And as we build these stronger bridges, may doves of peace hover around us as we do. And we're going to sing a very short prayer for him to a tune that we know. It's the tune Nouvelle Nouvelle, it's in our, actually in our purple book, but not the words, and the words were inspired by the Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp. We're going to sing it through twice. There is a little introduction of a very high harp music, and then I think I've got it where, they, where it begins, so I'll start and hopefully <coughs> you will join me. Thank you. <coughs> We now have our first reading, and uh, it speaks of doves and the spider and Mohammed. The doves, the spider, and Mohammed. <clears throat> Long ago, in the desert of Arabia, there was a small, beautiful, busy, colourful city called Mecca. It was special, a place to rest, to trade, and to pray. All around the desert were rugged mountains hills and caves, 
while the desert was a huge, empty space. In one of the caves lived a little lonely spider who longed for a friend. One day a pair of young doves flew by. The shrubs and bushes beside the cave looked good for building a nest, and so they did. They were protected from the wind and the sun, and the spider was so happy to have some friends at last. And no ordinary friends. These doves would take wing and bring back stories of all they'd seen. Often they would fly to Mecco, where they'd find grain, crumbs and water, and interesting tales they'd heard. There was one young man in particular who would often feed the doves. Mohammed was his name. He was from the family of Abraham and was known for his kindness and trustworthiness. Never did he pass anyone without giving them a smile or a helping hand. His goodness shone like a lamp in the darkness and the doves were drawn to it. The spider loved the stories about this extraordinary man who was so friendly with the rich and the poor, kind to animals, and told people who worked them not to overburden them. Well, time passed, the doves raised many broods of chicks, and while they were off searching for food, the spider would tell the chicks stories of Mohammed and sing them to sleep. One day on their return, the doves told the spider that Mohammed was in great danger the leaders in Mecca did not like his words, telling them to be kind to animals and to share their wealth with the poor. They were angry when he said they should stop worshipping stone and wooden statues and worship one God, the great creator, and plotted to kill Muhammad. One moonlit night, Muhammad and a friend came riding towards the cave. They knew they were being followed and spotted the cave realizing that despite being very small, it was the best place to hide. Gently they crawled under the spider's web and crept to the back of the cave. The spider had an inspiration. He would weave a web right across the entrance to the cave and sit right in the middle of it, as if to say, no one shall pass. The doves peacefully cooed in their nest, feeding their chicks, as the search party from Mecca arrived outside of the cave. One of them noticed it and commented that no one could have entered recently as the doves would surely have flown and the huge spider's web would have been broken. Inside at the back of the cave, Mohammed and his friends wiped tears from their eyes, amazed at the bravery of the doves and the speedy spiders spinning as Muhammad's killers returned to Mecca. The doves and the spider realized that they had been messengers from the Creator, and they thanked God for their part. Even as small creatures, they had been influential in saving a man of God. Thank you very much. It's a, quite an ancient uh, Islamic tale, and uh, good stories should be told. They, uh, they get remembered far more than anything else. We're going to sing one of our, our hymns that uh, we, we all love here, and we still love it in Portsmouth, where I go now. It's the purple book, or it's on the screen, and it's Spirit of Life.
time of reflection. And I'm going to ask if we could see the uh, little slideshow of the peace doves, please. As I said, this was inspired by... It was enormous, absolutely enormous. It filled the first section of Chichester Cathedral and it was powerfully moving. Um, particularly, we, we went in twice on the same day and the second visit, the Chichester Choral Society was rehearsing the um, Bach Magnificat and we had Bach music around us as we walked around the cathedral in contemplation of peace and there were people from all faiths and cultures there. This, it was an artwork actually by a sculptor, Peter Walker, who uh, we've seen another of his accidentally in St Albans Cathedral the most beautiful uh, bronze and steel leaves that were strewn flowing from um, an altar with the most beautiful messages of how trees and breath cooperate to give us the breath of life um, and peace as well. That was a few years back, but that was beautiful as well. Um, this particular artwork toured several cathedrals, but mainly up further north. Um, probably Chichester was the closest, I think, it came to down here, and, it, and it's our city, so. And there was a prayer trail, and we followed this around this lovely ancient building, and I've included some of the prayers um, today. So the, as we all know, the dove has a very symbolic place uh, in the view of peace, and it has a symbolic place in mythology and faith. Aphrodite... The goddess of love, or Venus in Roman mythology, is often depicted with doves fluttering around her or landing on her hand. The Blackfoot Native Americans assigned the dove for, as, to be a protector of their warriors, ensuring that they would return unharmed after a battle. I'm not sure how they reacted if the other side also had the dove protecting their warriors. The Aztec and Mexican um, Indian tribes would use doves in their wedding rituals as symbols of love. And in Hindu mythology, Kamadeva, the god of love, is known to ride a dove. Most of us are probably familiar with the story of Noah and the flood. And as the waters subsided, the dove returned as he'd sent her out with the olive branch in her beak, signifying that life on earth was indeed to begin again. The book of Genesis in the creation story speaks of the spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters and the face of the deep. Like a bird, a mother hen protecting her young or a dove. And then the Jewish commentary on this, the rabbinic commentary in the Talmud, names, names this presence as a dove. The Hebrew word for this, breath and dove and bird, is ruach, a feminine word, meaning spirit of God likened to the mother dove. The Arabic word, spirit, in the Quran is almost identical, ruach. So sadly ironic that these two faiths, so anciently linked, are currently and cruelly warring to protect their perceptions of their God and their spiritual and, nat and national identities with a lot of politics thrown in as well. They both began from the same ancestor, Abraham. Christianity, Islam, Judaism, we are all faiths of Abraham. Our late chief rabbi, 
lovely man, I've only watched on YouTube, but he is lovely, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, author of Not In God's Name, wrote in an Islamic monthly journal, how wonderful is that, a Jewish rabbi writing in an Islamic monthly journal, how much his Jewish community sometimes forget just how much they owe to Islam. Maimonides, a medieval physician and great Jewish thinker, wrote a volume on the Hebrew Bible of 14, a work of 14 volumes. And while he wrote it, he was in constant dialogue with the Muslim Kalamist thinkers. Rumi, the Sufi poet, was one of these. Rumi wrote some wonderful words. He wrote, make peace with the universe, take joy in it, it will turn to gold. Every moment a new beauty. My Monomede son, Rabbi Abraham, carried on this dialogue with another Islamic mystic, a Spanish physician called Alveros, from, obviously from Spain. His words, ignorance leads to fear, fear leads to hate, hate leads to violence, influenced Rumi. And Averroes was the first to form a religious argument for freedom of speech and was later quoted by Jewish sage, a Christian writer, and the secular writer John Stuart Mill, centuries later. Rabbi Sachs, and indeed I, found it, find it moving how first a Muslim, then a Jew, then a Christian, then a secular humanist came together to agree on the importance of free speech and the dignity of dissent. The first Bible uh, verses from the Peace Dove Trail were from Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the spirit of God, Ruach, was hovering over the face of the waters. We were invited to look up at the flock of doves, imagine the picture language of Genesis, and pray to bring peace and order to our world in the words Loving God, so often we hear of chaos and disorder in our country and the world. Wrap each of your people in your love. Hear us and say, come to me, all you that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We were reminded in the story in Mark's Gospel how the Spirit of God is a dove alighting on Jesus at his baptism, as he began teaching of building God's kingdom of peace and love, forgiveness and justice amidst the tyranny of the Roman Empire, who was, were also attempting to build a kingdom of peace and love and justice, but through warfare, with many people suffering from the heavy taxation and in extreme poverty. The prayer asked that we, filled with a spirit of truth, might attempt to build a world of peace where we are now. A world where people are wrapped in love and forgiveness and justice flows freely as a river. And those words are contained in our next hymn, 198 in the purple group, We'll Build a Land.
And of course, the words anointed by God really simply mean that if God is love and God is peace, that it is the God of our understanding, the spirit of truth and love, the source of all being that is with us and within us as we seek to build a world of love exactly where we are now and those little places grow. We have a second reading now and it's about peace by the Vietnamese Zen Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh. It's very apt for today, yet it was written in 1987. Many of us worry about the world situation. We feel that we are on the edge of time. As individuals, we feel helpless, despairing. We need to remain calm, to see clearly this is the meaning of meditation, to be aware, internally and externally, so we might be in a place where we can try to help. In Vietnam, there are many people, called boat people, who leave the country in small boats. Often the boats are caught in rough seas or storms. The people may panic and boats can sink. And if even one person aboard can remain calm, lucid, knowing what to do and what not to do, he or she can help the boat survive. His or her expression face, voice communicates, clarity and calmness, and people have trust in that person. They will listen to what he or she says. One such person can save the lives of many, our world is something like a small boat. Compared with the cosmos, our planet is a very small boat. We're, we are about to panic because our situation is no better than the situation of the small boat in the sea. We need people who can sit still and be able to smile, who can walk peacefully. We need people like that in order to save us from panic, overreaction, loss of hope. Mayahana Buddhism, which encompasses a wide range of Buddhist teaching, says that you are that person. Each of us can be, that each of us is that person. A little more reflection and then some meditation. I think that's a bit of a tall order. I am that person. You are that person. Each of us can be that person that in the midst of turmoil, for example, the storm facing us here, the small boat, any turmoils in life. Sadly, we have many people in small boats now. Our little planet is in turmoil, both with its climate and its people warring each other. How can each of us be that person? What it doesn't say is that this person that remains calm, clear and lucid, who might be smiling and directing, appearing peaceful, it doesn't say that on the inside that person was just as worried as everybody else was. It just is suggesting that that person is somehow able to bring about calm in the midst of turmoil, not necessarily replacing it. I want to share some words from a, sorry, a spiritual teacher that I follow uh, who was influenced by Thich Nhat Khan and Rumi. He's called Jeff Foster, and he writes very realistically about how challenging it can be to find that inner peace. <clears throat> so if it is that challenging, are his words compatible with Thich Nhat Khan, the Buddhist teacher? Well, let's explore. 
<coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> All four Gospels have Jesus quoting the words from Leviticus in the Hebrew Bible, love your neighbor as your self. Love your neighbor is often quoted and as yourself is often whispered afterwards as if it's an addition that really isn't very important. But this is what Jeff Foster is describing, this tough love of accepting our own individual vulnerability, our humanity, our inabilities, all the things that we perhaps wish we didn't have about us. The tough love of staying alongside our pain and struggles when we bring awareness of how our body is feeling enables us to love ourself by bringing in the form of breath bringing life to those situations and to our bodies and our human experiences. He says that this is how we start to find inner peace and how each of us can start to be that person. For a very long time now, many have been listening to guns and rockets, bombs and drones. We only hear and read of these, although of course we have been through, as many other countries, the two world wars, but currently we only see this or hear it on television and radio. Many have seen death and destruction day by day when we see the pictures of it, and even the pictures sometimes are just too unbearable to watch. The prayer trail at the Peace Dub ex exhibition asked us to wrap ourselves and others in love and peace. And that's what I suggest that we do now. We can ground ourselves now. If we can reach the floor, we can have both feet firmly on the floor, or perhaps the feet touch the legs of the chair, but they're in contact with something. We have our backs resting against these beautiful chairs. It's a floor and a seat that safely held many different people in this beautiful building. We can settle our breathing into a pattern that suits each of us. Maybe feeling that cool air entering our nostrils. That cool air is then warmed by our own beloved body. As we exhale, the warmed air is released back into the world to be recycled by nature for us to inhale again. Sometimes it helps to <clears throat> count the breath perhaps breathing in for a count of four and counting out a much longer breath. When we look and concentrate on our breath, we're bringing awareness to how the breath of life moves our bodies. Perhaps as you breathe quite deeply, quite steadily, you might feel your back moving against the chair. You may feel movement in other places of your body as the breath is circulated 
all around, reviving, refreshing, renewing. Sometimes when we wish to be at peace, it is best to simply stop trying and just be breath. Be breath, be the one breathing, be the breather. So as we continue observing breath, <clears throat> if we need to, perhaps we can let an image of peace fall away. The dream of calmness to just decrease, but allowing the hope and the possibility of breath relaxing our bodies to become our present experience. Can we come closer to that sensation in our bodies? Can we drench this very tiny moment with loving attention. Can we be curious as what is it like to feel not at peace? Or what is it like to now sense some peace entering our bodies? Sometimes there may be turbulent thoughts. Sometimes loud, judgmental voices in our heads. Or everything might appear calm and quiet. It is your experience. How your body experiences these feelings and the presence of breath is individual to you. Continue to bring that loving breath deeply into your body, bringing loving tenderness, tenderness to this moment, a warm presence to any calm or non-calm drenching ease or restlessness in awareness. This is the beginning of loving self. It is possible to internally be at peace with this one moment. we may discover a deeper, unconditional peace. We may become like the sky that holds even the most violent storm. We may be able to smile at our struggle to stay calm. Surely this is the peace that passes all understanding to love our fragile humanity. A peace that includes the ground and the breath holding us. And we're just going to listen now to some gentle, quiet music as we consider the peace within and the peace doves without.
prayer of peace from the Sikh faith. May we bring peace to all those we meet, those we talk to, those we live with. May we even bring peace to the person we hate, our enemy. May our friends enjoy our peaceful disposition and may our enemies enjoy our peaceful opposition. May this world be based on one word, peace. May in our hearts we pray this day for world peace. Sat Nam, the divine name, is truth. And some closing words by Saint Teresa of Avalon. May today there be peace within. May we trust our highest power that we each are exactly now where we are meant to be. May we not forget the infinite possibilities that are born of faith. May we use the gifts that we have received and pass on love that has been given to us. May we be content knowing that each of us is a child of the spirit of love, of the source of all being, of God. <clears throat> Let this present presence settle into your bones and allow your soul the freedom to sing and dance, rejoicing that love is here. This love is there for each and every one of us. <clears throat>